Before we get started, I have a little bit of a confession to make. I am a marine biologist. It might not seem like a big deal to you, but for the longest time when people would ask me, what do you do for a living? I'd feel a bit guilty. I'd have to tell them, I dive in places like this. <laughs> I travel across the world. I can't fish for a living. It's pretty great. But I come from Belgium, and you're not supposed to like your job. So I'd, immediately, I'd tack something on. I'd say, it's not that great. It's really not that great. It's, there's lots of work behind an office. There's, mostly, I'm just doing computer work. I'm doing statistics. That's it. That's changed. People no longer ask me, marine biology? Is that a real job? They don't ask, what's your favorite fish? What people ask now is, is the Great Barrier Reef really dying? They ask me, will there be fish for my children or my grandchildren? And people are onto something. Quite often now, when I go diving, I don't see this. What I see is this. It's pretty sad. It's not just sad for me, because I have to dive in these places. It's sad for everyone. The ocean is important for everyone, not just marine biologists, but also for people hundreds of kilometers away from the ocean, like here in Stuttgart. The oceans provide us with about 50% of the oxygen that we breed. If you like eating fish, guess where it comes from? Hundreds of millions of people depend on the oceans for their livelihoods. So the question whether our oceans are healthy or not is quite an important one. Before I talk about healthy oceans, let's, just, let's step back a little bit. Let's talk about a healthy human body. When we look at our bodies, we're made of different components, right? There's hands, there's legs, there's a stomach, there's a heart, there's a brain. All of our parts work together to form one functioning organism. If one of the parts gets sick, gets injured, we feel it throughout our whole body. Even something simple like a cold can make your day or your whole week quite difficult to deal with. It's similar in the ocean. Take a coral reef. Coral reefs are made up of corals, there's sharks, turtles, sponges, fish, crabs, all kinds of things. They all function together to form one hopefully healthy ecosystem. When one thing goes wrong, the whole ecosystem suffers. So what do we do when we get sick? Hopefully we don't get sick, we try and live healthy, but if we do get sick, we go to a doctor and the doctor will diagnose whatever is wrong. Sometimes it's easy. A broken arm, quite easy to tell. A big stomach bug, eh, easy to tell. Sometimes it's a lot harder. Our bodies are more than just big parts. Our bodies are made up of lots of small parts as well. Take our guts, lots of bacteria help us digest. Take your immune system. If our white blood cells wouldn't work properly, you'd get sick quicker, you would heal much slower. It's the same in the oceans. Oceans are more than just whales or corals or dolphins, whatever you want to think about, a lot of the ocean consists of small little, what I call critters, little fish, little things like this. They could be seahorses, the size of your fingernail. Could be little frogfish, which most people probably haven't heard of. Shrimp, colorful snails, all kinds of things. And these small critters, they're essential for the health of our oceans. But that's what the problem is. They're small. So, how do we deal with it as a marine scientist? Me, as a fish biologist, how do we deal with a small fish? Truth be told, not very well. It's quite hard to count fish that are this small. So what we do when I go count fish, we acknowledge there's lots of small things we can't count because they're too small. We don't have an accurate idea of how many. So what we just do is we ignore them, and we only count the fish over a certain size. There's some very clear problems with this, and I'm going to try an experiment with everyone. You kind of have to co uh, cooperate now to kind of show you what the problem is. So I'm going to try and see what the audience is. I'll survey the audience the way I survey fish. But because I can't count small people, I will only count the people that are taller than a meter 85. Could everyone who is taller than a meter 85 Maybe if you're on your tiptoes, 85, that's fine as well. Could you please stand up if you're taller than a meter, 85? Let's have a look. You could kind of wave. All right. So 
my scientific analysis would be, looking at my audience here in Stuttgart, is my audience consists of more than 90% of quite handsome males, <laughs> and the main health risk to the audience seems to be, I think, male pattern baldness. If I look around. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think we can all agree that's not a very accurate picture, right, of our audience. There's a lot more to see. So what do we do with these small fish? Well, we need new methods to find them. And that's where I come in. That's what I try and focus on, developing new ways of finding these small fish. So one of the things I discovered a few years ago is that a lot of small fish, they fluoresce. Now, now the toys come in. What fluorescing means is when I use this torch, which is nice and blue, I won't shine in your, in your eyes, it's a blue torch, it's quite bright, I'll try it there. The fish will reflect light at a different color. I can explain all I want, showing you is much easier. So when I go diving with this torch, the ocean kind of looks like this. I see fish that look like this. This is a lizard fish. They're usually brown, grayish, not much to look at. Sometimes I'll come across more eels. They peep out of their holes like little aliens. Sometimes I see these critters. This is, this is a sea spider, a small arthropod about two centimeters in size. Probably my favorite are these guys, seahorses. They're fluoresce. These are two different kinds. It's a West Australian seahorse and a thorny seahorse. They fluoresce in different patterns, but they fluoresce nonetheless. Obviously very pretty. Unfortunately, I'm not just a, a photographer. I, I am a scientist, so I have to do something with this prettiness. So, what's the point? Let me show you. Have a look at this picture. In your mind, try and count how many fish are in there. Have a bit of a look. This is the challenge I have when I go count small fish. Form an idea. Now, look what happens, this same area, when I put the fluorescence torch on there. It's a very beautiful scorpion fish. This is the exact same fish, taken moments apart with and without the blue light. So if I tell you which one would you prefer looking for, I think this is a bit easier. To kind of show this to you, what I've done is I've hidden a few small critters in this, um, in this room. You may or may not have seen them yet, so let's see what happens when I turn this on. Don't look too far. I'll step aside so you can see it right here on our TED sign. So this is what happens when I go diving. They tend to light up quite bright, sometimes in red, sometimes in green or different colors. Quite fun, isn't it? To me, it kind of feels like science fiction. It's, it's quite fantastic, but I've started using a new technique that's even, even more science fiction. It's, to me, it's almost magic. It's quite amazing. This method is called environmental DNA, or eDNA for short. It's a method that's been developed by microbiologists. Um, and in the last years, us marine scientists, we've kind of caught on that there's, there's something there. This eDNA method is quite exciting. It's based on the fact that every living being, whether you're a human, whether you're a fish, a coral, a plant, anything, has DNA in its cells. And every living being sheds that DNA. For example, here in the audience, you're sitting, relaxing, hopefully enjoying the talks. But while you're sitting there, your body is shedding skin cells, shedding hairs, hopefully not much else. But it's all there, the DNA, in this room, in this environment. What I would do with eDNA methodology, it's kind of the equivalent when everyone's left the room, I'd bring a big vacuum cleaner in, and I'd hoover up everything that's, that's in this room. Obviously, I'd get a lot of dust, but what I also would get is your DNA. The next step, happens in the lab. This bag of dust and DNA gets analyzed, and it's, it's best to imagine this as, as a needle in a haystack, the needle being the DNA. So what smarter scientists than I have discovered is kind of a magnet. Rather than sifting through the haystack of mess that's in there, we use a primer. So the primer is the name for this genetic magnet, if you want. And rather than sifting, we just get the magnet over there, and it attracts the DNA that we're interested in. As a result, we get a big list of everyone 
or everything that has been in this audience. So what this looks like now, when I go in the field and I, I do my surveys, I don't just count fish, I also do something very, very high-tech. That's why I've got more gadgets. So I'll try not to spill anything on this beautiful carpet. The first step is this. I'm on the boat or the side of the ocean. I take a cup and I collect some water. The second step, I take a syringe and I get some water in the syringe. The third step, now this is a small filter. I put the filter on the syringe and I will filter the water right through. So once everything is filtered through, I'm not going to get too messy, what we have in this filter is the DNA, or at least fragments of the DNA, of pretty much every living being that's been in the body of water in recent times. Colleagues of mine in Australia, what they've done is, they've done this method in a coral reef in Australia, and they've collected nine liters of water, which is a bit less than this bucket, just nine liters of water. After collecting the filters, putting it in the fancy machines that go bing, what happens? They found this. This is a view of everything that was there. Hundreds of species of fish, hundreds of species of shrimp, of crabs. On top of that, there were corals, algae, sponges, dolphins, you name it. What they kind of had is a snapshot with just nine liters of water of all the living beings on that reef. It's amazing. We can do more than just this. What I'm currently working on is one of the projects is in South Africa. What we're doing with colleagues there is we're testing in which bodies of water live small seahorses that are, that are endangered. So what we do is we find where the endangered seahorses live, and then we can tell managers, this is what you have to protect. In two weeks' time, I'm off to Indonesia to use this, me this method to test the health of coral reefs on remote locations in Indonesia. It's the future. It's right here. So let's look ahead a little bit more, because now it still takes about weeks till months until we have all the results. But in not too long, maybe 10, 15 years, in real time, I'll be able to take water from one reef, and I'll be able to say, analyze, maybe the day afterwards, I'll tell managers, this reef is overfished. There's no more big predators. We need to stop fishing here. I can go somewhere else and find, oh, there's bacteria here. These bacteria mean that there's effluent, there's pollution coming in. Maybe we have to take care that this river um, stops putting pollution in the ocean. It's endless. What we'll be able to do is have real-time information about the health of our oceans. It's scientific developments like these that make me quite hopeful about healthy oceans. Something else is changing. People are aware that the oceans are not healthy. There's something up with the environment. And people are quite willing to, to try and do something about ocean health. But there's always, there's always going to be a but. Very much like our human body, prevention is much better than the cure. For example, if I spend my life chain-smoking cigarettes, drinking two bottles of wine a day, eating nothing but junk food, even the best doctors or most sophisticated hospital is not going to be able to save me. It's the same with our oceans. The causes of bad ocean health, they need to be stopped first. No matter how good the science will get, if the causes don't stop, they'll be unhealthy. The causes are clear, we know them. The two biggest ones for the ocean, overfishing, and the climate crisis. They're big deals to deal with. But everyone, all of us, can do something about it. Even here in Stuttgart, no matter where you live, you can do something about it. There's three simple things that are not really that hard to do that you can do if you want to have healthy oceans. The first one, if you absolutely want to eat fish, go ahead, but make sure it's sustainable fish. The second, we need to stop using fossil fuels. We need to switch to renewables to decrease the amount of fossil fuels going in the atmosphere. The third, and this is probably the biggest thing anyone can do, vote. Vote for leaders who are willing to change our actions on the climate or on the environment. We need individual actions, we need people that do things in their daily lives, but without leaders that are brave enough to actually tackle the big questions, we won't have healthy oceans. If we do these things, however, I'm pretty sure we'll have healthy oceans for the future, 
And that way, I can just keep on counting fish. Thank you.